Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. All bets were off during this week's primary election. For the long-term future of our nation, we are suspending our campaign. With Cruz out, Donald Trump secures the spot as the likely GOP presidential nominee. But Bernie Sanders beat Hillary Clinton in Indiana. Does Sanders have enough momentum to keep moving forward? Plus, we'll look at winners and losers across the state and preview November's contests. Indiana's prison education program was credited with reducing recidivism, but the state cut it to save money. With someone with a long sentence like mine, you know, having something positive to do that engages the mind is critical. Ahead, a look at efforts to resurrect the program. And a visit to the Indianapolis Art Museum's interactive exhibit celebrating the state's bicentennial. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The race for president looks very different today than it did at the beginning of the week. As predicted, Indiana's primary is having a major impact on shaping the national election. Leading up to Tuesday's primary in Indiana, candidates campaigned aggressively across the state. It was a last chance to sway voters before Tuesday's primaries. Ted Cruz toured the state, making 10 appearances in just one day but his efforts to win over Hoosiers failed. We gave it everything we've got, but the voters chose another path. And so, with a heavy heart, but with boundless optimism for the long-term future of our nation, we are suspending our campaign. But hear me now, I am not suspending our fight for liberty. Cruz thanked his supporters and family and said he would continue to fight on for the future of the country. Mr. Donald J. Trump. An overwhelming victory for Donald Trump in Indiana clears the way for him to secure the GOP nomination. It's over with, folks. It's over with. And then we focus on Hillary Clinton. But the race for the Democrats is still up in the air. Bernie Sanders garnered around 35,000 more votes than Clinton in Indiana, winning the Hoosier state after imploring his supporters to show up at the polls. We win when the turnout is high. We lose when the turnout is low. Sanders' win provides his campaign with more momentum, but Clinton still has a significant lead in the number of total pledged delegates. Her supporters are keeping an eye on the big picture, and Clinton is focusing on her ability to get work done in Washington. People say to me all the time, well, you know, I'm going to vote for you, but are you going to be able to get anything done? Well, I'll tell you, I believe strongly in working with the other side, and I have done that as First Lady, as Senator, as Secretary of State. As the race for president moves on to Guam, Nebraska, and West Virginia, Indiana's primary has changed the landscape of the race. Hoosiers were also closely watching the race for Dan Coates' Senate seat this week. Coates decided not to seek re-election. As Harrison Wagner reports, that left two familiar faces in Indiana politics competing for the Republican nomination. While Barron Hill is uncontested in his bid for the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate, Congressman Todd Young beat off fellow Representative Marlon Stutzman to clinch the Republican nomination for the Senate race. Thank you, Indiana Republicans, 
Yeah. It took less than an hour after polls closed for Young to be declared the winner with just under 70% of the vote. Young faced some obstacles early in his bid. Democrats challenged the amount of signatures he needed to be placed on the ballot, but his name was ultimately allowed to remain. Senator Coates made an appearance at Young's primary party, praising the congressman and wishing him well. Hoosiers, in an overwhelming vote, have chosen as their next United States Senator someone who will carry on the vision that we've all had for the future of our country as directed by what we've done here in Indiana, Todd Young for Senate. While the Young camp was vibrant and joyous, the mood at Marlon Stutzman's gathering turned somber. Even though Young was leading in the polls, Stutzman supporters tried to stay optimistic, but Stutzman knew it was going to be a tough race. You know, when, when you're watching the news at night and you see uh, ad after ad pounding on you and uh, you know that's that's gonna be tough to overcome um, you know we did our best to try to, to to push back and to explain to people who this was who was behind Todd Young's campaign some young supporters such as Laporte Mayor Blair Milo shrug off the attack ads saying they're mild when compared to other campaigns this election season uh, and ultimately it is a competition of ideas and I think that for the most part it has stuck to the the principles that individuals wanted to focus on and where they want to, to put their emphasis when they go to Washington DC. Todd Young says he hopes Stutzman supporters will rally around him in order for a Republican to win the Senate seat in November. And to those Hoosiers whose vote we did not earn tonight, I just want to extend a hand to you. I'm prepared to work very, very hard to earn your trust and support because, you see, I know we share the same common sense conservative values. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Harrison Wagner. Young and Hill will face off in November, and it's not the first time Young beat Hill in 2010 for the District 9 congressional seat. State House reporter Brandon Smith joins us now live from Indianapolis. Brandon, as we just said, Young will face Baron Hill in November. So what's different this time? Well, for one thing, that was a House race. This is statewide, a Senate seat. And in 2010, that was a banner year for Republican candidates, a midterm landslide election, really nationwide. The electorate in Indiana tends to be a little more balanced politically in a presidential election season. We saw that someone with, somewhat with Democrat Joe Donnelly winning the Senate race in 2012. That said, at this point, Young is the favorite. Brandon, the Indiana Secretary of State reports a close race in the 8th Congressional District Democratic primary election. Can you tell us a little bit about that race and just how close it is? Well, that's a race between two former state lawmakers, David Orntlicker and Ron Drake, and they are separated at this point by just 64 votes out of more than 58,000 cast, with Drake holding that slim lead. Now, the results aren't going to be official until about a week or so from now, so we'll see at that point whether Orntlicker will ask for a recount. They're both vying to face incumbent Republican Larry Bouchon in the fall, and Bouchon has won the election for that seat three times now by double digits every time. And Trey Hollingsworth will be running against Shelley Yoder in November. Uh, what do you expect to see in that, in, in that race? Hollingsworth beat a very competitive field for the Republican nomination, one that included two state senators and the Indiana Attorney General. That race garnered a lot of attention because Hollingsworth has only been an Indiana resident for a few months. Prior to that, he lived in Tennessee. That and his campaign was essentially funded entirely by himself and his father. Now, Democrat Shelley Yoners, a Monroe County Councilor, she also ran for this congressional seat in 2012 unsuccessfully. Uh, as for the race itself, I expect the the attacks on Hollingsworth to intensify. His primary opponents tried to tag him with the moniker Tennessee Trey, but were perhaps a little late in ratcheting up those attacks. Democrats have already started. And Brennan, six Republicans were vying for a seat in the third district. Tell us a bit about what happened there. Well, there were three candidates with a really legitimate shot at the nomination, and that's two state senators and then a businessman, a political outsider, kind of mimicking that ninth district race. But in the third, the, the most establishment candidate, if you will, ended up taking the victory, and that's State Senator Jim Banks. A few seats, Brandon, were uncontested in the primaries, but politicians are starting to look toward November. John Gregg has begun to place ads on TV. What do you expect to see in the race for governor? 
Well, all signs right now point to a very tight race as incumbent Republican Mike Pence has had a fair number of, let's call them political missteps. Democrats have really been hitting him hard on his handling of the religious freedom law, the LGBT rights issue, uh, the abortion bill from this past session. I think this is going to be a really rough campaign from both sides. All right. Thank you very much, Brandon. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Barbara Brozier joins us for the latest headlines from across the state, news on Scott County's needle exchange, and a major recall at one of the largest medical device manufacturers in the state. Studies show education reduces recidivism, but in Indiana, the Department of Corrections phased out its college degree programs in 2012 because of budget constraints. Coming up, a look at an effort to bring at least some of those programs back. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. I can change the world with my own two hands. Make it a better place with my own two hands. I'm going to make it a brighter place with my own two hands. I'm going to help the human race with my own two hands. I can hold you in my own two hands, and I can comfort you with my own two hands. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. It wasn't just the elections we were following this week. Barbara Brozier is here. She has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. One of Indiana's delegates to the National Republican Convention is backing out because of Donald Trump's win. Now that Trump is the only one left in the race, attorney, attorney Joshua Claiborne of Evansville issued a statement that explained he would be passing his duties to an alternate because he does not believe Trump has what it takes to be president. More specifically, he says Trump opposes free trade, is skeptical of free speech and free association, and lacks the maturity to represent the country at home and abroad. Brown County was one of 10 school districts that posed school referenda on Tuesday's ballot, asking voters to raise property taxes to increase the school district's budget. Brown County's referendum passed with 59% of voters approving the increase that will give the district $1 million per year. Brown County Superintendent David Schaefer says the funds will help increase teacher salaries to help them recruit the best teachers. Eight of the 10 referenda post Tuesday throughout the state passed. The needle exchange program in Scott County will continue for another year. An HIV outbreak announced last year in the county has since grown to more than 190 cases, spread mostly through injection drug abuse. Following the outbreak, the Indiana legislature passed a bill allowing counties to seek approval for syringe exchange programs. Prior to that, they were illegal in the state. We have over 190 that are active participants, which means they've been here in the last three months, which is, is really good. Um, we're still getting new people all the time that sign up. Um, and the good news is that some people don't ever come back because they go to rehab or they quit using, which is a really good thing. Health officials in the county credit the exchange for slowing the spread of HIV and hepatitis C in the area. Flags are flying at half-staff in Monroe County in honor of a Navy SEAL and former Indiana University student who died in Iraq this week. Charles Keating attended IU and ran track and field and cross country from 2004 to 2006. In a statement, Governor Mike Pence thanked Keating for his service and extended his condolences to the young man's family. Flags will remain at half-staff until Keating's funeral.
Indiana Jobs won't be impacted by Cummins' decision to reorganize its operations. The Columbus-based engine manufacturer employs nearly 10,000 people in Indiana. In its quarterly earnings report, Cummins says it consolidated its power generation and high horsepower units to create the power system segment, which is headquartered in Indiana. Cummins expects its full year earnings to be down 5 to 9%. Cook Medical Group is recalling more than 4 million catheters because of the risk they could break off in a patient's body. The Bloomington-based medical device manufacturer says the products feature beacon tip technology and are primarily used for vascular catheterization. Last year, Cook recalled around half a million products with beacon tips. People who've traveled to a country where Zika was transmitted have to wait at least four weeks upon return before donating blood, and that's hurting Indiana's supply. The Indiana Blood Center says a significant number of donors are being deferred after traveling to affected countries. Unlike with more familiar infectious diseases like malaria, the restrictions apply to entire countries instead of specific cities. Indiana Blood Center says it needs people who haven't traveled to those countries to donate in order to address the shortfall. The State Board of Animal Health has lifted the last quarantine associated with the bird flu. The quarantines were on 10 poultry farms in Dubois County in the southern part of the state. The lifting coincides with the state reaching bird flu free status. That's after 90 straight days with no new cases of the disease. Bird flu was found in Dubois County in mid-January. Response teams spent 38 days getting rid of the virus. Three Hoosiers are headed to the big leagues. This is the most players IU has sent to the draft since 2010. Offensive lineman Jason Spriggs was taken the earliest. The Green Bay Packers chose Spriggs in the second round. Running back Jordan Howard was chosen by the Chicago Bears. This is the second consecutive year an IU running back has gone to the pros. And finally, quarterback Nate Sudfeld will be going to Washington. Last year, the Hoosiers made it to the Pinstripe Bowl. It was their first bowl appearance since 2007. Mercury will pass between the Earth and the Sun next week and cast a silhouette across the star's surface. The rare event is called the Mercury Transit. It happens Monday. It will be too small to see with the naked eye. The Kirkwood Observatory, though, in Bloomington is opening for visitors who want to watch the transit. The open house is from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. The transit takes place about once a decade. And the Indianapolis Zoo has named its baby orangutan Mila, which means dear one in Indonesian. Fans were able to take their votes to Facebook and select one of the five names. According to the zoo, the baby and mother Siri are still doing great. And those pictures are so adorable, Joe. I never get sick of seeing them. Now, was that the primary election for that name or was that the <laughs> real election? For this was the real election, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. For the first time in more than two decades, some of Indiana's prisoners could get help from the federal government to pursue a college education. The Obama administration announced last year the creation of the Second Chance Pell pilot program. The U.S. Department of Education will select a small number of colleges to partner with prisons as part of the program. As Barbara Brozier reports, that means some Hoosier prisoners could be able to pursue a college education for the first time in years. Michelle Jones is working in the computer lab at the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis. She spends a lot of time here. I have done research on the cult of domesticity and I've done um, research on um, cult of true womanhood and Quakerism. One of her most recent projects delves into the history of the very prison she's serving time in. She recently presented her research at a statewide conference via Skype and it's not the first time. We've done conferences. We've been able to Skype with the world and um, share our research. Jones says educational opportunities have been essential to her success here. She's serving the last year of a 21 year sentence for murder and neglect of a dependent. And more than two decades in prison can take its toll. The brain atrophies, I mean it does. And you begin to think on petty things, small things, and your scope gets narrower and narrower and narrower. So education was critical, and this program 
really was fundamental for me. Unlike the majority of women here, Jones has a college diploma. The opportunity for Indiana prisoners to obtain one while serving their sentences ended in 2012, when the Indiana Department of Corrections phased out its college degree programs to save money. It was one of the hardest days in prison. You would think something involving your personal self would be the hardest thing in prison. That was one of the hardest days to see their faces and their, their cries and their frustration. The Department of Corrections still offers high school equivalency programs as well as job and vocational training. But the opportunity for prisoners to earn a college degree, essential for many real world jobs, is only available if they pay the entire cost of tuition themselves. That could eventually change because of the Second Chance Pell pilot program. While a high school equivalency is important, it's only the first rung on the ladder. Uh, and so getting an opportunity for people to move beyond that I think is really important. Study after study shows education decreases a prisoner's chances of recidivism. According to the Indiana Department of Corrections, those with a college diploma return to prison at a rate of 21 percent, while those with an education level below a GED return at a rate of nearly 38 percent. I think it's pretty clear if you look at the impact of education on recidivism rates that in fact there is a correlation between people who have education and skills when they leave uh, a prison, being able to then have a meaningful kind of job afterward. Critics of the Second Chance Pell pilot program say federal money shouldn't be spent on educating people who break the law, but only prisoners who are eligible for release within five years can qualify for the grants. They also have to meet all other federal financial aid requirements. Just because they're a subset moved over here, I don't think that we should stop our educational process. So if it's for the general welfare of the whole state to educate people, it's to the general welfare of the state to educate 28,000 Hoosiers that are in prison. The U.S. Department of Education received more than 200 applications from colleges hoping to participate in the pilot. They'll partner with prisons and provide the college courses. It's unclear how many will be selected for the experiment or whether Indiana prisoners will have the opportunity to take advantage of the funding. I don't think it's realistic to think that the feds are going to send a large sum of money to any one state that would impact 5, 8, 10 percent of the, of the population. As universities wait for word on whether they've made the cut, Jones is holding out hope that an Indiana institution will be selected for the pilot. She already has her degree and wants the other women here to have the same opportunity. I don't have time to um, be idle and, and, get in, and get involved in the drama and the conflict that's so common in prison environments, right? Because I've got assignments, I've got a purpose, I've got a goal that I'm reaching towards that is recognizable not only in the prison but in the world. The Department of Education will select universities to participate in the pilot program later this spring. Indiana is turning 200 this year. To celebrate, artists and museums are preparing some special exhibitions. As J.D. Gray reports, the Indianapolis Museum of Art will be paying tribute with a round of miniature golf. Every hole of the mini golf course at the Indianapolis Museum of Art is a celebration of Indiana's history. Each one is as much a work of art as it is a game. I think what's interesting about it too is the artists are kind of that took this on is that it's a challenge of making something that's aesthetically pleasing, but it also needs to be something that is uh, fun to play and then also holds up for six months. So those three things are kind of a unique challenge to it. Local and regional artists created the pieces to honor the state's history. Among the holes are tributes to the landscapes and characters that shape the state. So we have a hole that is actually Vonnegut's studio that you'll be putting through. So it's a copy of actually Kurt Vonnegut's studio. We have a hole that's uh, saluting Benjamin Harrison. We actually put out of his mouth. And this hole plays tribute to New York Times crossword editor Will Shorts, who graduated from IU with a degree in enigmatology. The outdoor exhibit was built to withstand the elements. Maybe the best example of this is Willie the Whale. Willie was a fixture at the Indianapolis Zoo's previous location, but the sculpture has been in a field for the past 25 years. It was, they, it was at the zoo, and then when the zoo moved to its current site in the mid-80s, uh, Willie kind of went and went to pasture, literally. <laughs> the exhibit opens Tuesday, but members can begin putting today. For Indiana News Desk, I'm J.D. Gray. The exhibit will stay up until the end of October. 
This year marks the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500 and organizers are bringing back a tradition from the past to help celebrate. In the 1920s, the race had an official poet every year and a poem was included in the race program. Organizers ask writers from around the world to submit poems inspired by the Indy 500 to help mark this year's 100th anniversary. After receiving more than 200 submissions, they selected Adam Henze as the official track poet. I think in school, we often think of poetry it has to be this way or poetry has to be that way, and a lot of people are turned off by that. Uh, so I really like kind of showing people that poetry can be something else. Uh, and that it can be fun and it can be engaging. Uh, I would really love if there are people at the Indiana 500 that say, or the Indianapolis 500 that say, uh, you know, I'm not typically into poetry, but I, I like that guy. I think that'd be a pretty cool uh, thing. You can read Henzie's poem on our website, WTIUnews.org. And this is the kind of news that we love to share. Our WTIU, WFIU newsroom is proud to have won 25 awards from the Society of Professional Journalists for 2015. That's more than any other newsroom in the state. Now, among the 12 first place awards was in the category of best newscast for this program, Indiana News Desk. The judges remark that Indiana News Desk is the clear winner in this field. It stood above the rest in terms of in-depth reporting, enterprise, and the range of stories covered. So a big thank you and congratulations to everyone, cast and crew, who makes this program possible. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.